we, uh, I want to just reiterate that all audience members are entitled to see and hear. <laughs>
coming down from their eyes, talking about what medical debt. They're in debt for the rest of their lives, hounded by bill collectors. A woman was in the hospital with a terribly sick kid. The bill collectors are already going after her. 500,000 people in America go bankrupt each year because of medically related debt. It is a system, despite our huge expenditures, where large parts of our country are medically underserved, where today rural hospitals are being shut down, and where people, even if they have decent health insurance, have to travel long distances to find a doctor. It is a system in which we have today a massive mental health crisis, but we don't have anywhere near the kinds of treatment that we need to address it. It is a system, this is, you know, again, it, all of this to me is almost unbelievable. If we were a poor country, it would be explicable, not in the richest country on earth. In our healthcare system, as you know, today, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough psychiatrists, mental health counselors, we don't have enough dentists, we don't even have enough pharmacists. We have a major crisis in our public health workforce, and that is despite spending $13,000 a year per person. It is a system, and some of you may be running into it, where, again, unbelievably, if you go to medical school, graduate medical school, what kind of debt are people facing? Who wants to help me out on that one? <laughs> Tell me. 400,000, 400, right, 500,000. Just yesterday, uh, I was at a nursing school at Morgan State. Beautiful young people want to become nurses, will become nurses, leaving school fifty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 in debt. So here you have a crisis. We desperately need more doctors. We desperately need more nurses. We need minority doctors. And yet we're telling you, you want to be a doctor, good luck to you. You come out four or $500,000 a year in debt, in debt. And when you come and dealing with that debt, that influences the kind of specialty that you're going to. If I'm $500,000 in debt, I'm going to pay off that debt as quickly as I can. And that does not mean I'm going to do primary care in some rural town uh, in Iowa. Um, it is a health care system, again, insanely, in my view, where for most people, the health care that you get, the insurance that you have, is tied to your employment. Brilliant. You work at McDonald's, you work at a good employer, you have good in health insurance, your needs may be greater, and you have virtually nothing because you're a low-wage worker. Pandemic came, millions of people lost their health insurance, and the government had to respond very quickly to that because health care is largely tied to employment rather than being uh, universal. So the question uh, that we should be asking is how does it happen uh, that we spend so much money for health care and yet our results are so inadequate? Uh, and the answer obviously is bottom line, the function of the current health care system is not to do what everybody in this room thinks we should do, provide quality care to all in a cost-effective way. The function of the health care system is to make huge profits for insurance companies, drug companies, and others. And in that sense, my friends, the healthcare system is working very, very well. It is doing exactly what it is designed to do. Uh, top, top 10 uh, drug company earners made over $100 billion last year. Insurance companies make huge amounts of money. So what's the solution? I mean, the, the basic solution, fundamental issue is as a nation, we have got to conclude, and by the way, most Americans do believe this, that health care is a human right, not a privilege. And once you accept that understanding, then we can argue about how you want to go forward. I am not unsympathetic to the Canadian system because I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border. And in Canada, as you know, they spend about half as much as we do per capita. You're in the hospital for a month, you come out, there is no bill, you have freedom of choice regarding doctors and so forth and so on. Other systems do it differently. But bottom line, as a nation, we must resolve that health care is a human right, not a privilege. The function is to guarantee high quality health care to all people, 
regardless of their income, not to make huge profits for insurance companies and drug companies. The debate over health care uh, is not about health care. It's about economics and it's about politics and it's about who gets what. And uh, what we have got to do is to make sure that we don't have incredibly complicated systems, which we do, to make people money. We need a simple system, universal access, and we go forward. So, in my view, the solution is a Medicare for all single payer system. We have a Medicare system today, which is, by the way, under attack from the private sector with Medicare Advantage, but it is a system that is widely respected by the elderly. It needs to be expanded. And the program that we have brought forth would take it over a period of years, expanding Medicare to cover dental, vision, and hearing, so it's a more comprehensive program, then taking it down to people 55 years of age and down to people 45 years of age, and eventually cover every man, woman, and child in this country. So that's what our goal is. Now, to bring that about is really not a health care debate. It is a political debate. It is taking on some of the most powerful special interests in this country. It is dealing with the 30-second lies that I, have to dealt, that I have been dealing with my whole life and others have as well. You know, the arguments against us that, you know, you're taking away people's freedom of choice or you're taking away the insurance that you currently have. Yeah, you are. But you're going to have better insurance for all people. And that's the goal we have to have. So with that, I'm happy to answer the questions that you have. But we are in a monumental struggle which is, to my mind, tied to the fact as to what kind of democracy we are. Can government actually respond to the needs of people who are hurting with regard to health care, or are we going to continue to fall prey to the power of big money interests? So I look forward to working with you to finally reach the proud day when we can have someone say, you know what? Today, every person in America, regardless of where you live, color of your skin, how much money you have, you're going to go to a doctor. You don't have to take out your wallet. You don't have to fill out 58 forms. And you're going to get affordable prescription drugs as well. That day is going to come. But we need your help to make that day come a little bit sooner. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator Sanders, for those wonderful opening remarks. So the title of this session today is Healthcare is a Human Right, and you touched on that in your opening remarks. And you talked about one key aspect, if we all believed that healthcare is a human right, is that there would be the possibility of everyone getting access. I want you to talk a little bit more. If we did believe, as a country, that healthcare was a human right, what are other sorts of policies that would flow from that? And what impact would that have on people's lives? Right. One of the things that would happen, look, in a dysfunctional, broken, profit-oriented system, the goal is not to keep you healthy, certainly not to keep a low-income child healthy. The goal is to make as much money as you can. If we keep people healthy, you know, it saves substantial sums of money, but it's not necessarily in the best interest of the insurance companies or the drug companies. We do a terrible job in terms of preventative health. We are spending know, five, between 5 and 7% of our huge health care budget on preventative, on primary health care, compared to double, or in some cases even triple that in other countries. All right, so for example, and I know we're going to talk about nutrition, we're going to talk about obesity, uh, we're going to talk about you know, drug addiction and all that other stuff. But bottom line is our focus should be on keeping people healthy. And right now, at the very least, you know, what we should be having is a system. When I'm sick, I can walk into a doctor's office. Right now, for many people, they can't get into that doctor's office. They become sicker. They end up in the emergency room, which is very expensive health care. They may end up in the hospital, which is enormously expensive health care. Do we do a good job in primary health care? No. It is absolutely disastrous. So let's turn and talk about prescription drug costs, which is an area that you have spent decades working on. And there have been some recent wins. So for example, um, a leading manufacturer of inhalers announced that they would cap copays at $35 a month here in the United States. 
And last week, you were at the White House talking about reducing prices for adults who are in, or elderly who are in Medicare. And so this is a very complex space, which our students here of health policy understand. But from your perspective, how would you describe the root of the problem? And what solutions do you think are going to help us get to lower drug prices? Well, first of all, let me thank. I just met earlier with some of your folks who were doing a great job in, in helping us uh, understand the complexity of the uh, incredibly complicated uh, prescription drug pricing systems that we have. Just as in healthcare in general, the function of the pharmaceutical industry is to make as much money as they can, and they are. Year after year, they're the most profitable industry in this country. Ten companies made over $110 billion last year. All right? So they are doing very, very well. What, until very recently, the situation was, is that drug companies in America could charge any price they wanted for any reason whatsoever. Unlike countries around the world who have national health systems who would say to the drug companies, sorry, we can't afford that, we're going to sit down and negotiate a price. In the United States, any price they wanted. I have made two trips to Canada, as it happens, one for uh, breast cancer drug and one for uh, insulin. And in both cases, coincidentally, the prices paid in Canada were one-tenth the price paid in the United States. All right. So, What's the reason? The reason is until very recently, drug companies could charge any price they wanted, and they did charge any price, all right? What's the answer? Well, the answer is obviously we can learn from other countries, uh, and that we have to begin to negotiate prices with the drug companies. In the Inflation Reduction Act, for the first time, uh, Medicare now will have the ability to negotiate 10 drugs, and every year that's going to expand. Uh, the president recently in a State of the Union address correctly said that we should expand that. 10 drugs a year to 50 drugs a year for 10 years, 500 drugs, you'll cover most of the major and expensive drugs. So negotiating prescription drug prices is uh, perhaps the most important thing that we can do. Second of all, here at Harvard and other major and great universities throughout the country, you do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. Your medical people are doing a lot of research developing good drugs with money coming from the National Institute of Health. Right now, we can give a university a large sum of money. The money ends up coming up with the fundamentals of a new drug. A drug company takes that and then ends up developing, clinically trial, doing trials, developing the drug, getting it into the market, and charging us an outrageous price. Who thinks that it makes sense for taxpayers to pay for the development of a drug and then end up paying the highest prices in the world for that drug. Makes no sense at all. So what we have is a concept called reasonable pricing. If you're going to take money, if the taxpayers of this country are going to develop a drug, they're going to get it at a reasonable price, not some outrageous price. So those are some of the things that uh, we can be doing. So if we stick with prescription drugs a little bit longer, you have long advocated the use of prizes rather than patents to incentivize manufacturers to lower drug prices while they pursue innovations. So can you walk us through how that would work? Sure. Here is, if you talk to the uh, pharmaceutical industry, and I do, uh, <laughs> this is the reason they say, look, you look at, we have all these terrible illnesses in America, you got cancer, you got diabetes, you got uh, Alzheimer's, you got you know myriad of terrible illnesses. We are working night and day, we're just motivated to try to, to find uh, medicine that will deal with these terrible illnesses. But in order to do that, you know, research costs a lot of money, it does. Development costs a lot of money, it does. Got to do clinical trials, everything else. It's an expensive proposition. That's why we're charging you this outrageous sum of money. Is that true? No, it's not. Some, is research and development expensive? Of course it is. But these companies are making huge profits, a lot of money going into stock buybacks, into very uh, significant uh, dividends for their stockholders, uh, outrageous compensation packages, by the way, for their CEOs. These guys are making 20, 30. It was a guy from uh, Merck, I think, we had in the committee, $50 million a year. So these are profit-making machines. So how do you come up with an alternative approach other than saying to somebody, you've got to pay a high price if you want new good drugs? And the answer is, and we're searching for answers, but one of the answers is, 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 is taking a very different approach. It says, okay. You're a drug company, okay. We want you to come up with a solution to this terrible illness of Alzheimer's. Terrible. Uh, and you know what? You're gonna get rich if you do it. 
and we're willing to sit down with you, and you come up, and we're willing to invest in you, whatever it may be, you come up with that solution, you're going to be very wealthy. But the day that that drug is approved by the FDA, it now becomes free and available to the entire world. All right? You no longer have any intellectual property rights to that product. So I'm incentivizing you to do that. You're going to make a lot of money, and I don't have a problem with that. But the result of that research is going to mean that everybody in our country and everybody, in fact, in the world will be able to benefit from it. It's a public so, good. So now you have the insane situation that you have life-saving drugs that millions of people in our own country can't benefit from. Or if they do, they're taking money out of their food budget or they're going into debt. And even more grotesque is if you have poor countries all over the world, Latin America, Africa, you name it, people are dying. So I got a drug that maybe cost me a few dollars to manufacture. I'm going to charge you some outrageous price. You can't afford it. I'm sorry, you die. That is the logic of today's approach. We can do a lot better than that. Mm -hmm. So how you come up with the mechanism, we're working on it. But bottom line is, I don't have any problem with it. I respect immensely these scientists who are developing these drugs. They are enormously important. They have great potential for the future. I want to reward them. I want them to do great research. But I want, after that research is successfully accomplished, I want everybody in the world to be able to benefit from it. So let's switch gears to long COVID, which you have described as a public health emergency. And you just relieved draft legislation <coughs> for a long COVID moonshot. So help us understand what you're trying to accomplish there. Well, the first thing that we tried to do is uh, people, it turns out that there are over 20 million people in this country with long COVID. I mean, COVID, God knows, has been a terrible, terrible uh, situation for our country. We've lost a million people. And I think there was the general understanding, all right, it was terrible. We lost, you know, over a million people. Occasionally, people are still dying. We're over the hump, thank God, let's move on. Well, I wish that were the case. But it turns out there are over 20 million people who are suffering from severe symptoms related to their bouts with COVID. So the first thing that we wanted to do is tell these 20 million people that you're not alone, that we do understand that what you're suffering is real. And a lot of these people have not been taken seriously. They go to the doctor and say, well, I have some counseling for you, and it's, you know, it's kind of in your head and all that stuff. Uh, we had a hearing, and uh, you know, just, we had three excellent witnesses, and there was a woman, I can think maybe in her mid-40s, uh, she, she had been a, an employee and loved her job at a community college, as I recall. And she says, right now, my, you know, she worked really hard. She was a mother. Uh, she says, right now, it's really hard for me to get out of bed. To come to this hearing was a, a, a real struggle. Uh, a woman who had been an athlete, a runner. Uh, she is now able, I think she takes a dozen drugs a day, they're dealing with her symptoms, able to work, but at, at great difficulty. And then also, there was a mother of, I think, a 14-year-old girl, and said so this kid was really active, very social, you know, played in the band and all that stuff. Kid is undergoing terrible problems right now. So the first thing we wanted to tell millions of people is, we believe you. And it turns out that on the committee, there were a couple of Republicans who themselves either were dealing with long COVID or had family members who were dealing with it. So we didn't have to work too hard to make that case. Uh, the second thing is there was concern that the NIH had received over a billion dollars uh, to begin working on long COVID. Uh, there was the satisfaction with how rapidly or effectively they were proceeding. So we brought in some of their critics, actually, to a meeting with the new director of the NIH uh, and her staff to say, all right, look, this is what these guys, you're not doing enough clinical trials. You're not looking at potential drugs out there. Uh, you're not looking at the right things. Listen to some of the patients as well. And thirdly, um, we need more money to uh, do the kind of research that is necessary to come up with a treatment. As of now, there is no treatment. Uh, at best, we're dealing with symptoms, treating symptoms. So we have uh, what we're calling a moonshot, which would be a $10 billion investment in developing uh, a, a treatment for uh, long COVID. So I want to turn now to a topic that is near and dear to my heart, which is nutrition. And you've called for strong warning labels on front of packaged foods that are high in sugar or salt or saturated fat. You've also called for banning junk food targeted at children. 
I would love to hear what policies you think might secure bipartisan support, and how do you go about getting that in Congress? So let me tell you a story. Uh, a number of years ago, I was in, I was way back when I was in the House of Representatives, and we're sitting in the cloakroom, Democratic cloakroom, where you wait before you go out and vote. So I have a little vending machine there. I was thirsty, and I went in and I bought myself a grape juice. And I felt a little bit sick an hour later. <laughs> Turns out there were 39 grams of sugar in that little bottle of grape juice, which is what a, just about what a uh, Coca-Cola has. That is, I learned, you know it, I didn't, that's 13 teaspoons roughly, right? Imagine putting 13 <laughs> teaspoons of sugar into a drink. And kids are drinking this stuff all over the, all over the country. So what's the result of the marketing of processed food and these very sugary drinks is that we have an obesity epidemic in this country. Just large numbers of kids who are obese. And as everybody in this room knows, there is a direct correlation between obesity and diabetes. So you got companies out there that make huge sums of money selling crap to kids that are going to make them sick. Then you got drug companies making a huge amount of money treating the sickness that the food companies developed. It's a great world that we live in. Uh, so uh, obviously, we've got to raise focus on this issue. We are working with the FDA to make sure that they have strong uh, labels on, their, on the products. Uh, it took a long struggle. Now it's, you know, you'll, we'll take it for granted. But getting tobacco, cigarettes labeled, was not an easy fight. It took on the lies and the power of the tobacco industry. And we've got to do the same right now. There are companies out there making huge amounts of money, making kids sick. And we've got to deal with that. And do you think this is an area where there's bipartisan support? Uh, money, uh, well, the good news is probably the bad news is bipartisan support against what we're trying to do also. Uh, you know, the point that I've made 14 times and will continue to make is that many of these issues that we're dealing with have nothing to do with the healthcare debate. They have everything to do with politics and money in politics and the ability of big money interests to buy politicians. So the question is on this issue, are they buying more Republicans than Democrats? Probably. Uh, but you'll find uh, people on both sides not willing to stand up to very powerful interests. And that gets you to the most important issue, which I'll be talking about later on at the Kennedy School, is the power of money in politics. So, you know, I can sit here, well, you know, and, and say these things. You're running for office. And you go out and you campaign and you say, you know, I'm really worried about obesity and I'm worried about the processed foods and sugar the kids are eating. You know, I'm going to do something about it. And suddenly, guess what? Next day, there's a 30-second ad on television telling you, American people, people in your district, you want to take away their freedom to eat the food they want? This is Harvard uh, elitism at its worst. Now you have me on the election trail. There you go. <laughs> All right. You're telling people what they want to eat. Who the hell do you think you are? All right. And they're clever. They do polling. They know the ads are running. So what you're dealing with not is, it's not like a, it's sitting down with experts and parents and everybody. It's like, all right, what is the best path? What is good nutrition? How do we keep our kids healthy? That's not the debate. The debate is, you know, these guys are making huge amounts of money, just like the tobacco industry, just like the fossil fuel industry. Not a debate, I hope here, about the reality of climate change. What's the debate? The debate is the fossil fuel industry is doing great. What's the problem? Food industry is doing great. In fact, their profits are sorry. What's the, what's the argument? So it's a political debate, and we need to mobilize people to fight it. So I have one fine. Right okay, one second. So, excuse me, miss. I know I have four kids. I get disrupted all the time. All right, but let's let's have uh, disrupting. I know it's clever. Why don't you ask me? It's a tens, big, issue. big issue. Tens of billions into community health centers and workforce training, yep. with an emphasis on access to primary care. So, can you talk about why this proposal is important to you and how you intend to build support Look, for it? Look, we started off with a very simple proposal, uh, and that is everybody in America. Now, 
I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an advocate of Medicare for all. Uh, that's a bridge too far right now. Uh, too many, too much opposition to that. So I at least wanted to say to everybody, look, our primary care system is a disaster. Everybody agrees. No, we don't have doctors, we don't have nurses, we don't have dentists. And when people get sicker than they should, it ends up costing the system more, right? If I keep you healthy and you don't end up in the emergency room in the hospital, the system saves money. Everybody agrees, all right? So what we did is we came up with a very simple proposition. We said, I'm a big advocate of federally qualified community health centers. So what we said is, all right, how much will it cost to make sure that every community in America has a community health center where somebody can walk in the door when they're sick, get low cost prescription drugs, mental health counseling, dental care. And it was a big price tag. But at the end of the day, we think it will save the healthcare system substantial sums of money. So that's what we did. We also uh, came up with a number of proposals to increase the number of doctors. We did expand the National Health Service Corps. People here familiar with the National Health Service Corps? It's a federal program that says that if you take money to repay your debt, you can get that debt repayment forgiveness if you work in an underserved area. It's a good program for doctors, nurses, dentists, et cetera. We have expanded that. We expanded the uh, teaching health center program, which will enable residents to get, uh, do their work in primary health care facilities rather than just large uh, teaching hospitals. So, um, you know, we're making some progress, but we have a long, long way to go. And again, the bottom line here is when you keep people healthy, when you open the doors to health care access for people, it saves the system money. So we have a lot of bright, talented students here and they have a lot of questions for you. Good. So I wanna to turn to some of those. So Jorge, who is a postdoc in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Disease, asks, how do you navigate the need for universal health care in this extremely capitalistic, individualistic society? Are there ways within the existing system to make change, or do we need to rebuild from scratch? And you've partially answered this question already. Look, I mean, you know, I'm the chairman of the committee, and every day I gotta do the best that I can do. So I think, uh, you know, I mentioned we just discussed uh, the need to greatly expand primary health care, uh, the great need to greatly expand Medicaid, the need to greatly improve nutrition programs. All of those are important steps forward. Uh, but at the end of the day, this system is so dysfunctional, so wasteful, so broken, that we need a new system not based on the profits of the insurance companies and the drug companies. So Rachel, she's a Master's of Science student, asks, how can we convince policymakers to invest in prioritizing the experience of patients as a means of working towards health equity? Health equity? Yep. Uh, well, we can tell them to vote to undo Citizens United so that billionaires do not buy elections. Uh, we can tell them to stand with their patients uh, rather than their campaign contributors. Uh, we can tell them to listen to experts, uh, not just people who make money off of the system. Senator Sanders, thank you for this talk. I feel moved. Okay, so I don't Sophie, want to be interrupted now. Yeah. rural communities and our efforts to increase health equity in the United States. How can we be sure we're not? Look, there's no money there. If you're in a rural community, uh, you can't make money. So rural hospitals are shut down. We're having a hard time getting doctors there. Look, this gets back to, again, money in health care. What difference does it matter if you live in rural Wyoming or if you live in New York City? Every human being is entitled to health care. You're black, you're white, you're Latino gay, whatever you may be, you are entitled to health care. That has to be the principle. People go where the money is. And what we have got to say, every person in this country is entitled to health care. And by the way, on these issues, the American people agree with us. But it's once again American people, ordinary people, having to take on the power of big money interests. So Ariel, who's an MPH student, a Master of Public Health student, asks, what do you believe is the most critical action citizens can take right now to push for health policy change? Well, you guys can play a very important role. 
All right, we need you to be exposing how dysfunctional and wasteful and deadly the current system is. All right? You know, we're taking on a media that doesn't often talk about these issues. How often do you hear discussions about life expectancy? Washington Post actually last year did a, a very good series on it, but that is very, very rare. How often do you hear the reality that 60,000 people a year die because they don't get to a doctor on time? How often do you hear what it means to families who can't afford it? I get those letters, you know? My wife has an illness, I can't afford the prescription drug. All right, how often are we talking about that? So we need all of you to understand you're in a war here. You're in a war taking on very, very powerful special interests who really, in many cases, could care less whether people live or die. And you've got to decide which side you're on. And you've got to be vocal, and you've got to be prepared to take them on. And as you think about the folks that you hire on your staff and the, the young folks that you're surrounded by, what are the most important skills students of public health should be looking to gain right now? Not a skill. skill you can learn. It's whether you have, whether in your heart, you believe uh, that human beings are entitled, in this case, to health care, in a broader sense, whether you believe in justice. We have on Capitol Hill a whole lot of very, very bright people. They move around, and they're very good academically, but they're not really, maybe they don't come from backgrounds where their families have suffered, and they're not prepared to fight. So I hire people who have the guts then, and they don't leave, when they leave my office, they don't go to work for the drug companies or the insurance companies, <coughs> which is not usually the case on Capitol Hill. So I need people who have a passion to fight for justice. That's the major criteria. So Gabriel, who's a Master's of Science student, asks, why should public health students pursue public service when the government can seem so dysfunctional? When the government, what? Why should students pursue public service when the government can appear well, you see, so that's the same question that you just asked me. Why? What are you going to do with your life? You want to go work for the drug companies? <laughs> what do you want to do? You want to work for the... Look, you have to make a choice. Good. You know, a lot of people in Harvard do go to work for Wall Street. They go to work for the uh, big tech companies. Make a lot of money. How many people at Harvard go to work in low-income public schools? Not a whole lot. How many people at Harvard are going to, you know, you've got a group of people here, but they are outnumbered a thousand to one by the drug company. How many of you are prepared to not make huge amounts of money? All right, so I don't ask me. That's your decision to make. Why should you? You have to go into your own heart to do that. If you don't think you should, go to, you know, go to Wall Street to make your money. But that's a choice that every individual is going to have to make. So and the issue of the dysfunctionality of government. Well, how do you change that? And that we have to work on as well. So Peter, who's an MPH student, says, there's a lot of talk about healthcare spending being too high, which you talked about. <coughs> Do you have any insights as to how, as a country, we can come to a decision about how much is too much and how much is not enough, particularly as there's a push for healthcare systems to provide more wraparound services and address social determinants of health? Um, we spend twice as much as other countries, and our outcomes are worse. So for a start, we, we could save huge sums of money by doing, obviously, rational things. Um, a lot of the waste is in administration. So think about the number of people who work for insurance companies who are hounding you because you're late paying your bill, or you're hounding them because they didn't cover what you thought they should be covered. Think about every employer in America having to navigate an incredibly complicated uh, insurance system. If you have universal health care, it doesn't matter whether you work in McDonald's or you work on Wall Street, all right? It's a simple system. You walk in to the doctor's office. We can save, according to the Congressional Budget Office, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars by eliminating all of that administrative waste and that bureaucracy. So the insanity is you've got huge numbers of people who are hounding us to pay our bills or to tell us that we're not covered when we thought we were covered, but we don't have enough doctors and nurses and dentists. So we need people to provide health care to people, not to be in the middle making a system incredibly complicated. You do that alone, you save hundreds of billions of dollars a year. 
So Senator Sanders, you talked about how Medicare for all is probably not gonna happen right now, so instead you're focusing on other areas in healthcare. Can you talk a little bit how you decide what issues to push for? So how do you decide on the art of the possible versus what is not going to happen? Well, that's a good question. You know, we sit around debating that all of the time. Um, you know, often it is where the public is. All right, for example, um, we were successful in uh, negotiating with uh, major drug companies to substantially lower the cost of asthma inhalers. Now, why did we choose that? I mean, you could have chosen 50 other illnesses because you got millions and millions of people. So this is already a popular issue that, oh, I don't have to give a long speech. You say to somebody, do you think it's okay that you're paying $300 for an inhaler and somebody in Canada is paying 10% of that? So you don't have to, it, that's easily understood. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, uh, is it a, a widely used product in this case? Uh, is the contrast between other countries clear? Are these companies making huge profits? Those are some of the factors that I would look at. Right now, uh, we're taking a hard look at another drug, which is in the public eye big time, and that is Ozempic. Uh, you know, we have the food companies making us heavy, and then we have drug companies making a fortune trying to prevent us from getting all kinds of diseases because of our obesity. Uh, right now, Ozempic is uh, charged in this country, the list price for it is something like $1,200. In the UK, it is $59. In Canada, it's $155. Uh, so last week, we had a little discussion with the CEO of Novo Nordis, who manufactures the product, uh, to talk about the need to substantially lower the cost of that price and we're working on a campaign to make that happen. But again, this is a product that is gonna be used by many millions of people. It's a product that if we don't get a handle on, will bankrupt Medicare. I mean, the estimate is it could be $150 billion just for one drug from Medicare, which is unsustainable, not to mention state budgets with Medicaid. So those are some of the factors that we look at when we choose to go where we go. So we have a number of students who may be interested in running for office. What's your advice to them? I have no advice to them. <laughs> but I'll say this, you see, this is the point. And I've been around, every other day somebody comes to me, oh, I'd like to run for Congress, I'd like to run for the Senate. It doesn't interest me. I don't care what you want to run for. If you want to run because you want to run to become a senator or a president or a congressperson, so what? What you have got to decide is what you really believe in and what you're prepared to fight for. Politics and elected office is one way that you could do it. I just met with some people doing great research on the high cost of the drugs. That's another way to do it. You could be a doctor. I talked to some of the bravest people I've ever seen. People who came back from Gaza who are working, you know, in the horrible situation that is there. Doctors Without Borders, people like that. Working in low-income communities. Uh, being involved in your local school boards. I mean, there are a million ways that people can have an impact and every one of us is different. But I'm not impressed by saying, oh, I don't want to run for office. It doesn't mean anything to me, personally. Uh, we've got a lot of people who run for office and they, you know, so what? It means whether you are what you stand for and whether you are prepared to take on enormously powerful special interests who will make your life different, uh, difficult. Uh, when I ran for the Senate, uh, back a long time ago, 2006, I ran against a guy who happened to be the richest guy in the state of Vermont. Uh, and for six months, I and my family had to deal with really disgusting 30-second ads, you know, suggesting to me that I was uh, sympathetic to child abusers, you know, all kinds of horrible things. And that's what candidates do. You don't run for office? And you're serious about taking on powerful special? I have friends of mine right now, often women of color, who are in the House, who have done the right thing on a lot of issues, including uh, the war in Gaza, including taking on powerful special interests. And you got groups out there who are prepared to run ugly 30 second ads against it. You ready to take on that? That's what you got to think about. Because if you don't, you can slip in, be it like everybody else, and trust me, nothing, you know, you'll accomplish nothing. And there are very few who are prepared to take on those special interests. So before you think about running for office, think about your motives and, you know, think about what you're willing to deal with uh, if you get elected. So one of the things I think that makes you particularly powerful is the way that you communicate your ideas. So can you talk a little bit about how important it is to communicate clearly to different audiences and how to make the points relevant to the group so they hear them? 
Well, I think, I don't know that it's a question of you know, learning uh, how to be an orator or the, taking speech classes. It's a question, the reason, if I may say so, I, I, one time I was watching a well-known politician on television uh, with somebody and looked up and they said, you know what, nobody believes what she's saying. Because young people, especially, what they call a bullshit factor. They could see right through it. So the question is, you know, if you believe, you know, you don't have to be, there are some great people who are not great orators, but if you are prepared, you know, you say defining things clearly, you have to then look at the reality of the moment. You cannot talk about healthcare if you don't talk about the greed of the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical companies. So you can write a 300 page treatise, and if you're not talking about that, you're not getting to the root of the problem. If you're not talking about the corruption in the pharmaceutical industry, you're not prepared to do that, you can write you know, all you want to write. You'll be also great, write your master's thesis. That is the issue, all right? And if, so it, it's, not, it, it's simply trying your best, not that I know it all, I don't, <coughs> but trying your best to tell the truth as you see it. Well, I understand there's 700 well, healthcare okay. workers. But then, okay, well then. <laughs> I am proud, you know, what I am trying to do. It's not what I have accomplished. It's, you know, what we are trying to do. This country faces enormous crises, enormous crises. And I know a lot of people become dispirited by looking out whether it's climate change, whether it's wars, whether it's big military budgets, whether it's a dysfunctional health care system, child care system is collapsing, public education is in deep trouble. You name it, we got it. We have many, many problems. In my view, if we work together, and you know, we don't let right-wing people divide us up by the color of our skin or our sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera. If we're able to work together and have the guts to take on very powerful specialists, I think we can address those crises and create the kind of country that I know that we can become. So thank you all very much.